All right, Happy New Year. We're going to go ahead and kick things off. So it's such, such an exciting way to start the new year, as you're about to hear. Um, but as always, we want to bring to your attention the upcoming presentations, the House staff, the fellows housewide debate is always very lively and engaging and we encourage everybody to come to that. Um, you can see in Jan uh, Jan later in the month we'll be rebranding Langerhaus, uh, cell histiocytosis, and then I'm so happy to see, see Leanne Ward on the agenda. She's a very dear friend of mine and she and I have collaborated for decades and it's a really going to be exciting to host her. She's a pediatric endocrinologist who really is one of the world's thought leaders on metabolic bone disease across many, many different uh, diseases, Crohn's disease, Duchenne. So I really think uh, faculty from all of our subspecialties would benefit from hearing, um, meeting Luann, Leanne and coming to her presentation as is the case for today's speaker. Um, I hope you've been seeing all of the announcements about the Engage series. Um, really a phenomenal um, series of workshops that um, highlight many of our strengths and the department's strengths in education and innovation in education. The uh, echocardiography course on congenital heart disease is coming up. Um, increasingly, the Division of Pediatric Cardiology is doing innovative work in coursework and boot camps and all sorts of things, and this is one um, to share with your colleagues. We always have to do the uh, planner and faculty disclosure. And with that, I'll invite David uh, to the podium, our Chief of Pediatric Endocrinology. We couldn't be more excited to introduce you to Anna Goyne, who is the newest member of the department. So welcome. And she's really good at Soul Cycle. And if you want to have coffee with us, you can, we'll tell you when we're there. After, you can meet us after. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. And uh, indeed, very, uh, very pleased that Anna's going to be joining us on faculty on February 1. Um, and she will be a professor of pediatrics and, and the department and the division also have a courtesy appointment in genetics and be uh, on the UTL line. Uh, Anna got her PhD at uh, University of Oxford with Professor Robert Turner, who's uh, famous in the uh, field of diabetes, and then continued on as a professor um, since 2014 at Oxford. Um, she's won numerous awards, um, including the Diabetes UK Hodgkin's lecture, the Croc Lecture, the EASD European Association of Study of Diabetes Minkowski Lecture. Prior to that, won the Study of Diabetes Rising Star Award from the EASD. Um, and uh, her overarching uh, research is to identify therapeutic targets for type 2 diabetes treatment through mechanistic studies of proteins causally implicated in type 2 risk through human genetics. Um, her work's highly collaborative, working both with industry and with numerous partners internationally in academia. And she has extensive experience both in uh, mentoring um, and teaching um, from the level of undergraduates through postdocs and junior faculty. And uh, also very pleased uh, to note that she's already received her first NIH grant routed through Stanford um, with uh, Song Kim, who's the director of our uh, Diabetes Research Center. And so uh, very thrilled um, that Anna is going to be here and also very excited about her talk. She's a wonderful speaker um, and we're really, uh, really excited. So. Anna, welcome. And also, she, uh, I believe, uh, said she just got her offer accepted on a house, which I think is the uh, we all can, uh, you know, really get excited about. So, thank you. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I am absolutely uh, delighted to be here. Thank you both to David and Mary for those uh, kind words and introduction. Um, as I said, as you've heard, I'm uh, already embedded uh, in uh, Stanford life, having been here uh, since the summer when my husband and I both relocated. Um, yes, I have a house, I have a California driving license, but I'm going to have one disclosure, which is that I'm still working on European SI units. So I apologize through my talk if I haven't got the, uh, the local language correct, but I, I'm still not fl uh, fluent in Fahrenheit or in mix per deciliter. So uh, as uh, uh, David said, my work is highly collaborative and I thought it might be very fitting to start off this morning uh, with a collaboration uh, between Katia Mattis, who is uh, a recent PhD from my lab. Uh, she defended her thesis uh, at the end of last year. And this was a collaboration with uh, Felicity Cormack, who is a traditional wooden block print artist. And uh, Katia and Felicity, Felicity worked together to find a way of representing Katia's project in a series of uh, art pieces uh, that uh, uh, Felicity put together using the traditional skill set. 
This uh, picture here is an illustration of CATIA's CRISPR genome editing of human iPSCs that are subsequently differentiated to uh, pancreatic endocrine cells. I think it's a really beautiful uh, piece of work, and I shamelessly use it in all my presentations, but as you can see, with uh, uh, correct credit to those who generated the work. So today what I would like to do is uh, give you an overview of some of the work that I've been involved in over the last few years in Oxford and work that I hope to build on here with my transition to uh, Stanford. So uh, I thought it would be quite uh, fun to show you where I've been for the last 15 years in Oxford and obviously where I'm going to be moving forward. And I think it's fair to say that only one of these pictures is a true representation of the uh, weather. Um, I've, I, in, the, in the time that I've been here, I think the picture uh, on the right hand side it is far more uh, accurate. And uh, I don't know when they took this picture in Oxford, but it's very, very uh, seldom as sunny and blue skied as that. So the focus of my research is on uh, diabetes. And uh, as I hope you uh, are all aware, diabetes is a major global challenge. Uh, there are 415 people estimated to be affected by diabetes worldwide, with the vast majority of those having type 2 diabetes. The estimated annual cost of treating diabetes and its complications is mind-blowing. It's $327 billion here in the US. That's $1 in every seven uh, is spent on uh, treating diabetes and its complications. It's easy to forget that it's the largest single cause of amputation, stroke, blindness, end-stage renal disease, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And the trouble that we have is that the treatments that we currently deploy to treat diabetes are not disease modifying. In the context of this audience, I thought it was worth mentioning that there is increased prevalence of diabetes, particularly among youths and uh, youths of uh, minority racial and ethnic groups. And this was reported in 2017 by the SEARCH uh, study. So the major focus of my research over the last 20 years has really been to capitalize on human genetic discoveries and to use uh, variants that we know are causal for uh, diabetes or increase your risk of developing diabetes as tools to interrogate cellular and molecular mechanisms underlying pancreatic beta cell dysfunction in type 2 diabetes. And then ultimately what I aim to do is to translate this new knowledge into uh, something with clinical utility. Now this might be through the identification of uh, new uh, genetic etiologies of diabetes where we can use that information to help with prognosis and diagnosis. It might be through the identification of safe and effect effective uh, therapeutic targets for drug development or it could be through a stratification of patients, putting them into groups where we can treat them optimally with existing therapeutics. Now we have pretty compelling evidence that this is likely to be a successful approach, and there are many examples that I could share with you, but the one that's close to my heart is work that I was involved in when I was a postdoctoral fellow working with Andrew Hattersley at the University of Exeter. And during my time with Andrew, I identified heterozygous activating mutations in a key component of the machinery that couples glucose metabolism to insulin secretion in the pancreatic beta cell. And through the identification of these mutations in patients like Lily, we were able to transfer them from insulin injections onto treatment with oral hyperglycemic agents, sulfonylureas. And this was on the basis of understanding the genetic etiology and understanding the genetic mechanism, realizing that sulfonylureas that were already treat, used to treat patients with type 2 diabetes could circumnavigate that defect in uh, uh, how the beta cell was responding to metabolism. So this was an example of precision medicine. It was uh, an opportunity to change the way that we treated patients on the basis of understanding their genetic etiology. But it was also an example of how human genetics could take us to safe and effective therapeutic targets for treating diabetes more generally through, uh, through uh, the identification of sulfonylureas. So what I thought I would do today is really focus on the elements of my research that were most close to that translational end of my research portfolio. And what I want to do is really cover three main broad themes. 
I want to give you a sense of how we can use human genetics to inform on diagnosis and prognosis and uh, treatment for monogenic varieties of diabetes. I want to spend uh, quite a bit of time talking about the current challenges that we face uh, interpreting genetic variants. And then I want to finish up really with some uh, more recent uh, work from my group talking about the in insights into beta cell dysfunction that we can learn from understanding the genetic basis of type 2 diabetes and give you a flavor of how this might have implications for precision medicine. Now, I recognize it's quite early in the morning, so I'm also going to pepper my talk with some beautiful illustrations of what uh, uh, girls at Headington Prep School in Oxford think a scientist looks like. This one here is my particular favorite. Um, any of you who spend any time in the lab will appreciate why. Look at that clean bench. Look at that attention to health and safety. We've got the goggles on. We've got the, uh, the gloves. Um, this is somebody that I would very happily take into my laboratory. So let's kick off talking about what we know about uh, monogenic forms of diabetes. And I think one of the most important uh, varieties of monogenic diabetes to recognize is maturity onset diabetes of the young. Now this is uh, characterized by non-insulin requiring diabetes and it typically and usually presents in children and young, adult, young adults under the age of 25 years. It's characterized by autosomal dominant inheritance, but it's heterogeneous, and we know that there's at least six uh, different varieties of Modi. The two that you're most likely to come across in a clinical setting are due to mutations in the glucokinase gene, GCK, and in the transcription factor, HNF1-alpha. Now, the photograph I'm showing on the, uh, the right of my slide is uh, uh, from Andrew Hattersley, and this is one of the first families that was identified uh, with uh, Modi. At the time that the uh, photograph was taken, we didn't know what the genetic cause was, but we recognized that there was a monogenic variety of diabetes that was co-segregating within this family. And you can see that by looking at the bride, uh, who was the proband in this study, who was diagnosed at the age of 12. Then if you look at her uh, mother, you can see her mother also was diagnosed early the age of 23 and then you can see down the front that we've got the bridesmaids who were uh, diagnosed at the age of nine so this was uh, recognizing that there were different types of diabetes that uh, co-segregated in an autosomal dominant uh, way within a family the uh, two varieties that i want to spend some time on today telling you about are the two that are most common uh, the first one of these was uh, identified by Philip Krugel and Andrew Hattersley back in 1992. And this is uh, uh, mutations in the glucokinase gene, and it's characterized by mild fasting hyperglycemia. And uh, patients with this variety of diabetes will have a fasting plasma glucose level between 5.5 and 8 millimoles uh, per liter. The critical things to recognize about this variety of diabetes is that it is stable and non-progressive. The ETR means that what happens is you get a, sh a shift in the set point for glucose stimulated insulin uh, release but insulin secretion remains regulated and because of this pharmacological treatment is very rarely required and in fact large recent studies have shown that it does not affect uh, uh, glycemic control and uh, what's very uh, good about this diagnosis is that there's a low risk of the development of uh, diabetic complications, even though patients are exposed to mild hyperglycemia for their lifetime. So if you're going to get a, a diagnosis of diabetes, this would be the one that you would want to get uh, because uh, the uh, prognosis is very good. In marked contrast to this is uh, Modi due to mutations in the transcription factor HNF1-alpha. This is a progressive form of diabetes, and it is often uh, misdiagnosed as type 2. The risk of complications in patients with this variety are the same as if you were diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. The uh, etiology uh, uh, is characterized by a low uh, renal threshold for glucose, and the critical part of our understanding of this variety of diabetes is that it really is beneficial to identify these patients because you can treat them uh, optimally with low-dose sulfonylureas as opposed to insulin injections. So finding a diagnosis of MODI due to HNF in a patient and their family is really important because you can uh, tell them not only about their prognosis, but you can also change how you manage these patients. So at this point in time, uh, we really have been able to deploy precision medicine for monogenic forms of diabetes for quite some time. 
Um, so this is a, a schematic taken from a recent review that I did with uh, Dan Drucker. And what it shows you is that there are four uh, main groups of monogenic varieties of diabetes, and that when we understand what those uh, genetic mutations do to the beta cells, we can put them into different categories based on etiology. So glucokinase mutations affect glucose sensing within the beta cell. HNF1 alpha mutations affect insulin secretion. Uh, the KCNJ11 mutations that were the cause of neonatal diabetes, and they also cause MODI, are uh, working through the uh, KTP channel. And then there are rare forms of diabetes that affect uh, 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 peripheral insulin sensitivity, such as uh, mutations in PPR gamma and lamina C. And each of these can be treated with different classes of agents based on where the defect is. So by understanding the genetic basis of the diabetes in your patient, you can choose the optimal treatment uh, for this individual. For those of you who uh, see patients um, uh, with varieties of diabetes, I thought it might be quite helpful to tell you where you can uh, get some help with uh, working out what variety of diabetes your patient have. And Andrew Hattersley and his team, um, led by uh, Bev Shields in Exeter, have put together a really helpful app that you can download onto your Android or iPhone, and you can enter in your clinical uh, characteristics of your patient, and you can get a probability that they have MODI, and you can also get some direction on whether you should have them tested for glucokinase or for HNF1-alpha. You can find details of this app on um, uh, their website. You can also find really helpful information um, on their website about applying for a, a genetic test. And even though you might locally use a different genetic service, I would highly recommend using their website as a source of information. They have forms that you can uh, download um, uh, where you can also see what are the types of clinical information that they use to uh, get the best sense of what variety of diabetes you have. And this has been in operation now for many years. So what I wanted to do now with my talk is really tell you about when this doesn't work, when there are things that come up that actually challenge our understanding of uh, uh, monogenic diabetes. And the work I'm going to share with you now has just been accepted for publication uh, as of uh, uh, Monday in Diabetes Care. And it's work that's really been led by a very talented uh, clinical training fellow, uh, Shivani Misra, who's based at the uh, Imperial College in London. And Shivani and I have been working together for some time on a, a cohort that she's established in London, where she's been looking at the etiology of diabetes in, uh, in a variety of different ancestries based on the local population. So uh, I thought what we would do now is talk about uh, what happens when our understanding of Modi is uh, challenged. And I'm going to introduce this to you with a case that uh, uh, Shivani identified in her clinic. So the proband presented at the age of 28 years in her adult clinic in uh, Imperial. Um, they'd been diagnosed with diabetes at the age of 15 and they were being treated with insulin. Um, interestingly, what Shivani uh, noticed was that they were experiencing hypoglycemia even though they were on a very low dose of insulin. She also noted that the uh, random C peptide was unusually high in somebody uh, 10 years post-diagnosis with type 1 diabetes. And for what it's worth, at the uh, time she saw the patient, autoantibodies were negative. But of course, that's not necessarily conclusive given that it was 10 years post-diagnosis. Uh, what was really striking was that when she asked uh, the patient for their family history, uh, she found out that they had an identical twin brother who uh, had also been diagnosed with uh, type 1 diabetes at the age of uh, 12 and was being treated similarly with low-dose insulin. And there was a family history because the mother had been diagnosed uh, during pregnancy at the age of 29 uh, with diabetes and was being currently treated with metformin and glycolyzide. So uh, Shivani rightly thought this doesn't look like type 1 diabetes and there is something uh, unusual happening here. So she uh, sent them to uh, Exeter um, for uh, genetic testing, and uh, they identified a, a novel mutation, A251T, in the HNF1-alpha gene. But this is where it gets interesting, because what they found was that the mutation was in the homozygous form, not heterozygous form, in the proband, the identical twin, and it had been inherited from parents who were heterozygous carriers for this variant. 
When we look at the uh, evidence that this mutation might be causal for the diabetes, it's not present in the NOMAD uh, database as uh, of uh, July 2019, and it hadn't been reported elsewhere. The uh, variant sits in the DNA binding domain of the transcription factor, so it was logical to imagine that this might have an effect on transcription, um, transcription factor function. But the questions here really are, this is a homozygous variant, uh, not a heterozygous variant in our uh, patients with a Modi-like phenotype. And the uh, parents who are heterozygous carriers of the variant do not have a typical presentation of uh, HNF and alpha uh, Modi. So why does this variant um, uh, not cause a typical Modi? So one of the things that we uh, wanted to do was see if we could find additional evidence that would convince us that this mutation would be something uh, pathological and affecting HNF1 alpha function in carriers. So we turned to some work that uh, I published back in uh, uh, 2010 in collaboration with my clinical colleague, Catherine Owen. And back in 2010, we had identified that a, um, HRCP highly sensitive CRP was a biomarker for uh, HNF1 alpha MODI. This is on the basis that the transcription factor regulates CRP in the level, in the liver. So if you have a loss of function mutation in this transcription factor, your ability to regulate CRP is compromised. And we were able to use uh, serum uh, CRP levels of a way of uh, distinguishing patients with uh, type 2 diabetes from those that had HNF1 alpha MODI. So on the basis of this, we hypothesized that CRP levels should also be compromised in the family. So we measured a highly sensitive CRP in uh, the mutation carriers, and we were able to show that this was consistent with the mutation being functional uh, in vivo because the uh, carriers all had low levels of uh, CRP. So the next thing we uh, did was uh, Shivani came and visited my lab in Oxford and uh, was able to work with some of my team to see if she could characterize the patient she could identify. And we have in our lab a series of assays set up that we can deploy to uh, test whether or not mutations have a functional effect on transcription factor uh, activity. So the first thing uh, Shivani did was look and see whether or not this variant affected the ability of the transcription factor to bind to DNA. And if you look at uh, this uh, figure on the left-hand side of my slide, you'll see here that this is the wild type for uh, a regular transcription factor. Here we've got two mutations that we know cause MODI and uh, we know uh, are in the DNA binding domain. Um, and you can see that both of those compromise DNA binding activity. And over here, we have Shivani's mutation that she's identified in the family. And you can see that it uh, reduces DNA binding, but to a less extent than these two previously reported mutations. She then looked at the ability of the uh, mutant transcription factor to uh, activate the human uh, albumin uh, promoter, which is regulated by HNF1 alpha. And we have our controls here. So empty vector, the albumin promoter overexpressed in the uh, same construct. Then applying wild type uh, HNF1 alpha, the two MODI controls, and our variant of interest. And as you can see, there is a, a reduction in HeLa cells, which do not express HNF1 alpha in uh, transactivation activity, but it's not uh, to the same extent as the two previously reported MODI mutations. And if you look over here in INT1 cells, and these are our, our, our rat insulinoma beta cells, a line that express HNF and alpha, you can see that uh, there is an attenuation of protection. So from these uh, in vitro experiments, uh, we could conclude that there was a, a reduction in DNA binding and transactivation activity, but it was most pronounced when you, when you didn't have uh, any endogenous HNF alpha, and also it was not as severe as uh, bona fide MODI mutations. So this is consistent with uh, the uh, A251T uh, mutation being hypomorphic. So I guess from a, a clinical standpoint, the, the most pressing question is, will this have any relevance for how Shivani manages uh, this family? Um, so what she did next was uh, do a metabolic investigation to uh, explore uh, the response to uh, a mixed meal and to look at the response to uh, a salt and barley beer. 
And this is data on the pro band. And what we're looking at here is uh, glucose levels in blue, uh, insulin levels in red, and here is seed peptide in green. And this is the response uh, following the mixed meal tolerance test. And this is the response to uh, gabenclamide. And you can see here that uh, there's an excellent response to the sulfonyl urea. And if anything, the patient uh, was uh, hypoglycemic. So uh, on administration of glucose, uh, uh, glucose levels have been resolved. And you can see here that this is a, a good response to a sulfonyl urea. So on the basis of this, the uh, proband and her brother uh, and his brother have both now been transferred onto oral sulfonyl ureas and are being successfully managed with a reduction in their HPC. So if you look here, uh, this is some continued glucose monitoring on the uh, proband, and as I alluded to at the start of the case report, uh, there was evidence of hyperglycemia on uh, insulin, and following a transfer onto uh, oral sulfonyl ureas, you can see that uh, glucose levels are, are better managed. Okay, so to summarize uh, Shivani's work, uh, Shivani's identified uh, a biallelic hypomorphic variant in H1-alpha um, and has demonstrated hypomorphic variants can present in a typical um, OD uh, phenotype. This is the first uh, report of such a finding and is in contrast to mouse work, which has suggested that uh, loss of H1-alpha would be embryonic uh, lethal if you lost it with alleles. Um, and the significance we feel of this work is that with increased access to whole exome genome sequencing, particularly in sanguineous populations, the identification of hypomorphic alleles is much more likely to be something that should be considered when you're thinking about genetic diagnosis of patients. Okay, so uh, with that new knowledge, I want to uh, turn to uh, a, a theme um, which is about um, uh, an allelic spectrum with a, a gene that's implicated in any condition. So we're talking about this in the context of uh, diabetes. So for HNF1 alpha, we have these uh, fully penetrant rare alleles that so are causal for the monogenic variety of diabetes. Only. I've just told you about these hypomorphic rare alleles Shivani's identified that um, are less severe, uh, fully penetrant patients, but they can still cause a monogenic variety of diabetes. We then know from work from Paul Nolstad and Jose Flores that there are population specific variants. E508A identified in uh, Mexican Americans and has been shown to increase risk of developing type 2 diabetes. This is a common variant in the population. We then have common alleles that many of you in the room will carry that increase your risk very modestly of uh, developing type 2 diabetes, and we have uh, neutral alleles. So you can think about these as uh, differing on their frequency in the population and uh, differing in their impact on the transcription factor function, and then having a relationship with severity of your diabetes. So this is um, challenging if you go for a genetic test, how are we going to decide where on this continuum your variant sits and what your uh, uh, diagnosis should be? So uh, a major part of my work over the, the last few years has been to uh, try and come up with innovative uh, frameworks for trying to interpret genetic variants in the context of diabetes. So we've been asking the question, how do we know when a rare HNF and alpha missense variant causes mode? So to address this, we turn to a large uh, data set that we've been working on in collaboration with um, Mark McCarthy, uh, David Altshuler, uh, Mike Benke, and Jose Torres, which we published back in 2016. And this was a whole exome sequencing of 13,000 individuals. And um, 6,500 individuals with type 2 diabetes and 6,500 control. And in that exome sequencing data, we identified uh, around 80 missense mutations in the HNF alpha uh, gene. So working with Paul Nolstad and uh, his uh, team in Bergen, 
he set about to do a very ambitious study, which was to functionally characterize all 80 of these variants in a really comprehensive suite of assays in our lab, looking at translation activity, protein expression, and cellular locality. And these are all uh, functions of the transcription factor that have been implicated in the metastatic basis of HNF1 alpha MODI. So for a subset of the, these that were located in the DNA binding domain, we also looked at their ability to bind DNA. So this project was carried out in two separate labs. Um, it uh, involved a whole raft of individuals and presented a, an enormous amount of data. And what we've been trying to do with this data is really uh, challenge the way that labs currently use functional to bind to come up with a more innovative, a more inclusive uh, way of uh, using those data to try and interpret uh, variants. And this work has been led by uh, Sara Ahari. Sara was a PhD student with myself and Mark McCarthy at Oxford. And uh, the basis of her PhD was to uh, come up with analytical frameworks for interpreting HNF1 alpha variants. So Sara took very large data set um, of 80 variants and used uh, an approach that's gaining a lot of momentum in uh, uh, genetics, uh, in particularly in the context of polygenic risk scores. And she used an unsupervised clustering approach uh, to see if she could tease out what the most important contributors to uh, HNF and alpha function were. So first of all, she was able to show using a principal components uh, approach most important characteristic in terms of HNF alpha dysfunction is transactivation. And then using K means clustering, she was able to use all of this data that was generated, plus uh, clinical information and biological information, uh, including frequency and um, where the uh, mutation sits in the structure of HNF alpha, to separate out these uh, uh, missense variants into groups that broadly fell into a line neutral, intermediate, and damaging. She then used hierarchical clustering to see if she could separate these out further. Um, and you can see that we ended up with, again, a spectrum of HNF1 alpha mutations. So using this approach, we've been able to revisit a number of inter, uh, national Modi diagnostic uh, registries, looked at uh, the UK uh, national uh, registry and also the Norwegian national uh, uh, registry. And where we have got overlap variants that we have studied and those that have been identified in those uh, registries, we've been able to explore whether or not our functional framework alters the genetic diagnosis of the alleged individuals. And on this basis, we've been able to reclassify 9% of individuals in the UK uh, registry and the Norwegian registry. So we're hoping that what we've started to do here is to build up a way that we can bring lots of these types of data come up with a more inclusive, uh, comprehensive framework for uh, interpreting uh, variants. So that's all very well and good. Uh, we did that on 80 variants that we identified in the project. But what are we going to do now that most people are in a position that if they wanted to have the money, they could get their uh, genome sequenced? This means that we're continuing to identify novel and rare variants in h so we're going to need uh, to escalate our abilities to generate data. So what Sarah has uh, also done is uh, she spent four years of her life uh, setting up what I able to present on one slide. Um, so to make sure I do her work fully justice, I'm just going to take you through what she has uh, achieved. Sarah worked with a company Twist to generate a library of all possible HNF1 alpha this sense of uh, mutation. That's 12 and a half thousand. She then uh, set up a pipeline to package the library uh, into uh, lentiviral vectors and then to deliver these into HeLa cells. And what she had done prior to this was she had identified a set of genes that were regulated in this cell by HNF cell. And then she had developed a cellular assay that allowed her to measure how well HNF and alpha was able to regulate genes. And the one we picked in the end to do our uh, assay on TMS, TM4SF variant. So what uh, Sarah did was uh, she uh, infected 
cells with the library, um, and she then sorted cells uh, based on uh, the amount of uh, this gene that was present in the cell by fact, and she sorted them into three different populations. We then isolated genomic DNA from these cells and then used next generation sequencing to uh, sequence the identities of each of these pools. And we could then describe the uh, missense alleles that were identified in each of these pools so that we would know whether or not the variants were loss of function mode variants, whether they had an intermediate effect on function, or whether <coughs> it was like a wild. So this data is currently uh, working its way by our analysts, but we have it in hand in time, so we are fairly confident we have a robust uh, readout. We've also got a second uh, way going through with a different transcriptional uh, readout in a different cell line, so we'll be able to put those two data together. For the first time, this is going to give us a library of every single HNF mouse variant. Which in theory means that uh, in the coming uh, year we'll be able to bring this data together with other data sets so that we can set up a model predicting HNF1 alpha uh, variant uh, function used in a diabetes setting. And we're working with FinGen, monogenic uh, uh, diabetes expert panel, to uh, implement this in uh, analysis framework. So to summarize the second part of my talk, um, I've uh, given you a taste of some of the work that we've been doing using a, a fresh approach to look at the data, using unsupervised clustering with multidimensional functional people to aid clinical interpretation of HNF1 alpha variants. And then I've shared with you some really exciting data that Sara Althari has just generated, where we have been to live 12,500 HNF1 alpha Sense variants uh, so that we can understand the impact on function. And the current effort really is in developing ways to integrate functional data, biochemical data, better clinical data to aid variant interpretation forward uh, identification of novel uh, HNF1 alpha variants for individuals with diabetes. So, um, having given you, um, I hope, a good flavor of how human genetics has been. Uh, really important in our ability to deliver precision medicine in, in the clinic for monogenic variety of diabetes. I now want to give you a taste of some of the work that I do um, on type 2 diabetes and how we can use uh, genome-wide association studies to leverage information on molecular mechanisms for pancreatic cell function. So uh, the predominant uh, gene discovery uh, for uh, complex traits in the last 10 years has been GWAS. And uh, GWAS has been phenomenally successful in identifying regions of the genome that robustly associate with disease risk. And to protect diabetes, this is no exception. We now have over 400 regions of the genome that we know alter your risk of developing uh, type 2 diabetes. But unlike the examples that I've shared with you for monogenic diabetes, the challenge that we face for GWAS is that most of the signals don't sit neatly in the sequence that codes for a protein. They sit in non-coding uh, space where we assume that they're having an impact on gene expression. And this means that we can't go straight into the lab <coughs> looking at those uh, 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 proteins and working out what the molecular mechanisms are because we have transcript uncertainty. So a major part of my uh, research at the moment is trying to work out which uh, proteins these GWAS signals are. Sometimes, though, things can work out nice and simply. And one of the things that we wanted to do early on was to see if there was any low free. Were there any coding sequence uh, variants that we could uh, identify, that we could uh, take directly to the lab? And we turned to a uh, study that I uh, previously introduced you to, where we had exome sequences of 13,000 individuals. And within that data set, we identified uh, two variants in the gene called PAM that were associated with type 2 diabetes risk. Now, these variants um, are quite rare. So one of them is only 1% of the population, and the other has a minor allele frequency of 5%. But what we do know, looking at these variants that don't have is that they both impact the uh, pancreatic beta cell function because they're associated with indices measure how well the beta cells are secreting insulin. 
We also know from work that Jason Flanick has done uh, that there is what we call a burden signal for type 2 diabetes. So if we look collectively at all the variants that have been found in PAM, uh, there are um, over 35 of them, and these are more likely to be found in diabetes than those that do not. So PAM is clearly a really important gene in terms of altering how your beta cells uh, function and what your risk of developing type 2 diabetes is. So in my lab, what we wanted to do was to work out what the mechanistic basis was for how these variants might influence your pancreatic beta cells. So PAM is a really important enzyme in our bodies. It's it expressed quite widely, and it's particularly found in neuroendocrine pituitary granules. And it's a very important enzyme. It's the only one that we've got capable of uh, uh, amidating glycine extended peptides to increase their biological. We looked to see whether it was expressed in uh, human pancreas cells, and we were able to identify it both to cells in alpha cells and pancreas, and we were able to uh, also identify a, a model, a human a beta cell model we use widely in our lab, which is known as beta race one. The two variants that are associated with diabetes sit in part of the catalytic domain of PAM, so it's quite uh, plausible to think how they might impact on uh, enzyme function. So we've got diabetes-associated variants, both of them sitting in a functional domain, but we can start to see what they might do to PAM function. And we know that PAM is widely expressed and critically found in pancreatic diet. So the first question that we want to ask is, uh, do uh, variants in PAM to a loss or a gain of function? Because if you were a drug company and you wanted to investigate PAM as a therapeutic target, you'd want to know whether you want to take more response of it in terms of altering the risk of diabetes. So Anne Ramondo, who was a postdoc in my lab at the time, developed an assay from scratch where she could measure the activity of recombinant PAM uh, on, and its ability to amidate. So you can see here in uh, green, this is the 5% variant, and this here is the world PAM. You can see that there is a reduction in its ability to amidate. Over here, you can see that the 1% variant um, results in an unstable protein because we were unable to detect it by Western or by IF. In this case here, where we have um, uh, the tethered variety, you can see that uh, it's mislocalized. We have the secreted variety, you can see that it's absent. So both variants result in a loss of function, but they do so for different reasons. Uh, the first one, 5%, through reduced uh, catalytic activity, and the rare rare of the two through loss and mislocalization. So now that we know that uh, the variants of increased diabetes risk do so through uh, loss of PAM uh, function, what we want to know is what happens if you lose PAM in your pancreatic beta cells. So to do this, uh, Cern Thompson, a PhD student in my team, uh, set about uh, taking our human pancreatic beta cell model and SIRNAs to knock down the PAM gene, and then looking at the impact of the loss of PAM on insulin secretion and insulin content. And what he was able to establish very clearly was that if you lose PAM in your pancreatic beta cell, you get insulin secretion and insulin content. We worked with Patrick McDonald at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, uh, who we have a long-standing relationship with, uh, where we're working to establish a human islet biobank. Uh, we've been performing genetic analysis of these human islets, and uh, Pat has been uh, comprehensively characterizing their to uh, secrete uh, insulin. So taking this data set, we could show that uh, we could mirror the effects on insulin secretion in content in carriers of these type 2 diabetes risk variants. So at this point in the story, we know that if you lose PAM in your pancreatic beta cell, you have effects on uh, insulin content secretion. I haven't showed you, but we were also able to show that there's a direct effect on insulin glycosis. But you may remember I mentioned that PAM is widely expressed. It's not exclusively in the pancreatic beta cell. It's also expressed in other neuroendocrine secretory granules. So we were wondering whether or not there could be indirect effects on the beta cell through the amidation, defects in amidation of other peptides that influence insulin secretion. And one that particularly caught our eye is GLP-1. Now, GLP-1 is released from the L cells of the 
gut follows uh, will, and uh, GLP1 then travels to your beta cell, where it uh, binds to the GLP1 receptor, which is a G protein receptor, and then uh, it amplifies insulin secretion. So it's called um, uh, an incretin. So uh, what we wanted to ask the question now is that if you have a type 2 diabetes risk bearing hand, could it also influence your pancreatic cell function indirectly? So do uh, type 2 diabetes risk carriers have a reduced increase response due to uh, reduced amidation of the LP1? And to remind you, the incretin effect is the uh, difference between uh, the amount of insulin you uh, secrete following the oral glucose challenge and the amount of insulin you release when you bypass uh, the gut and you have uh, intravenous glucose uh, uh, given. So this here is thought to be due to GLP-1 and other incretins that are released from the gut following exposure to food. So to test this, uh, Mahesh, uh, a clinical fellow working with myself and Mark McCarthy, set about to do a recruit by genotype study. So we work with the Oxford Biobank, which has over 9,000 individuals who have been consented for us to approach them, either on the basis of their genotype or their phenotype. These individuals are non-diabetic, and we uh, identified 20 heterozygous carriers, 1% variant, uh, that's related to your risk of diabetes. We then matched them for age, gender, and BMI with controls who didn't have diabetes variant. And then we invited them into our clinical investigation unit for a uh, detailed bespoke investigation. On day one, they had an oral glucose tolerance test, and on day two, an isoglycemic match camp. So to show that the study design was fit for purpose, um, Mahesh developed an assay to measure serum activity of PAM. And as you can see, there's about a 50% reduction in PAM activity in individuals who have type 2 diabetes risk variant. So this tells our study design is fit for purpose. And then we wanted to look at the data that he had generated on 20 versus 20 for the matched isoglycemic clamp. So uh, rather disappointingly, and against what we were expecting, we saw no differences in the increase in uh, response with uh, respect to the uh, genotype. But interestingly, when we dug deep our data, looking at uh, the uh, circulating levels of total anaminated GLP-1, which has been measured by Jens Holtzberg in Copenhagen, we were able to demonstrate that there was increased GLP-1 levels in individuals with the type 2 diabetes uh, risk gang, but no difference in their incretin response. So this suggests that if you have this variant, you have increased resistance because you have uh, increased levels of the uh, GLP-1 one, but it's having no biological impact. So if we bring this information together, we can now uh, uh, see that we have evidence for a direct impact on beta cells and an evidence for an indirect effect, although there is no effect on uh, incretins. Uh, uh, so this, uh, we believe, is consistent with a compensatory increase in GLP-1 secretion due to incretin Resistance in type 2 diabetes risk antigen carriers. So that's all very well and good. It's very interesting. We're very excited from a, a, a mechanistic standpoint. But again, will this have any translational relevance? So we thought if individuals are uh, you know, resistant, this might have uh, an implication for how a clinician decided to treat a patient uh, with type 2 diabetes. And the reason for this is that a major part of the arsenal for treating uh, Type 2 diabetes are GLP-1 receptor agonists, and they account for about a third of the non-insulin anti-diabetic market. So we thought an important question to address would be, if you have one of the type 2 diabetes risk alleles, does it mean you have a worse response to GLP-1 receptor agonists? So to address this question, we've been uh, collaborating with uh, Ewan Pearson at the University of Dundee, um, who really is a leader in pharmacokinetics for type 2 diabetes, and also working with Angus Jones at the University of Exeter. Uh, Angus is a clinician who's been uh, working on a number of studies that he's been looking at the impact of receptor agonists, um, namely the Exeter study. And Mahesh reached out to both of them and were able to get hold of genotype data on uh, a variety of different cohorts uh, in uh, patients who'd received uh, GLP-1 
agonists. And as you can see in our discovery cohorts and in the uh, replication uh, cohorts in the aragonocide arm, you're able to see that there was indeed uh, an effect of uh, varying the response. 30% uh, of non-carriers achieved target HPLC of less than 7% in six months, but only uh, 0 to 10% depending on the 1.5% of variant are able to achieve this in previous. So we think this is really exciting. We think it's uh, uh, looking solid, but the important thing is replication, replication, replication. So we're now working uh, with the Excel uh, trial uh, where we've got a larger data set of 6,000 people to see if we can replicate this within the study. So to summarize this part of the talk, um, I've given you a taste of some of the work that we're involved in where we're trying human genetics in the context of type 2 diabetes to get better insight into uh, pancreatic cell function. Our PAM work enabled to show that there's reduced amidation of homocanon A. I didn't show you this, but that is actually the mechanism for decreasing excretion <coughs> and altered epigenetic epigenetic uh, release. I've shown you our preliminary data that if you have a PAM risk allele, uh, you have an uh, effect on uh, increased resistance, and we think this is clinically relevant because we think this also then alters your ability to respond to the LP1 receptor agonist. So for the final part of my talk, I want to uh, continue that discussion about spectrums and uh, having that relationship between uh, functional severity and clinical severity. And I want to ask the question, are there rare variants in the PAM gene which could cause a monogenic diabetes? This is a collaboration with Francis Collins and Laurie Bonacastle uh, at NIH and with Martin Black uh, in Finland. And this uh, is uh, data that they have uh, obtained and they performed whole exome sequencing on a number of probands who had been diagnosed with either neonatal or early onset diabetes. They identified uh, a rare de novo, so this is novel and de novo mutation in PAM after the 6 s in the proband. Now, the proband presented at eight months of age uh, with moderate diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, the plasma glucose was very high, 32.6 moles per litre. Critically and unusually for neonatal diabetes, the birth rate was normal. The pa uh, patient was autoantibody negative um, uh, diagnosis and treated with insulin. So this uh, variant that they've identified sits up here in the pro region of uh, PAM protein as in a, and is in a completely different area to these two type 2 diabetes associated variants that I've been talking about in my previous slide. They're up here in the sick domain. This one is here down. <coughs> so when we think about what the potential mechanisms could be in this patient why they have early onset diabetes, we can think uh, that they could have pancreatogenesis. There's certainly precedent for that with patients in PDX1 and PDX1A. They could have beta cell dysfunction. That would be similar to the mutations I described in KCNJ11 at the start of the talk. Or they could have a reduction in beta cell number. And there are also precedents for this patient in the transcription factor GAP6 and of course the insulin. However, we can tell from the uh, clinical characteristics that there's no uh, exocrine deficiency. So that leaves us with two potential avenues to explore, either beta cell dysfunction or a reduction in beta cell number. So Shahana Sangupta, um, a PhD student in my lab who's again recently completed and has now embarked on a, a clinical training in Georgia, London. Uh, Shahana set about to see whether or not this variant affected insulin secretion. She generated a human pancreatic beta cell where she knocked out CRISPR, the PAM gene. And then she tried to rescue uh, uh, insulin secretion by either uh, putting in wild type or the type 2 diabetes variant or our new uh, uh, novel variant, R36. And she, you can see here she was able to rescue insulin secretion with wild type, not with the type 2 diabetes variant, she could rescue again uh, the neonatal diabetes variant. So this so shows that there's no impact of R36S on insulin secretion, and it shows is in contrast to the type 2 diabetes variant, which does have a secretion. So it doesn't look like there's a beta cell dysfunction um, uh, system at play. So she looked then at whether or not there was an impact on beta cell number. She was able to see, again, comparing her mutation with type 2 diabetes variant, 
that there seemed to be an effect on cell viability, cell survival, because uh, when we looked at three and six days uh, transfection, there was a reduction in cells for those expressing six X. And she could see that there was evidence of uh, ER stress and cell death by measuring a number of um, markers. So this data seems to be consistent with R36S having an effect on cell death, uh, working through ER stress. Again, suppressing this, this is how insulin mutations work, and also a number of other syndrome um, um, components of the ER stress pathway. And we think what's really important is that we don't see any of these uh, uh, phenomenon for Two diabetes bearing, showing that these are likely working through very different transactions. So where we are with this at the moment is that we've been trying to reach out internationally to find uh, see if we can find any other survival cases of ground variants. And NF1 is not enough to describe new genetic etiology. We've reached out pretty extensively um, and so far have not found another family with a PAM variant. Um, we do think that the data we have is compelling. Uh, we think that the fact that the um, mechanism is beta cell loss, um, the diagnosis takes eight months, not in the first weeks of uh, uh, life, is consistent with this uh, and ER stress uh, and mediated. So what we're doing now to try and get clarity is uh, we've just generated a CRISPR mouse with uh, R6S allele, and we've just got these mice going reading at the moment, um, and we hope that we'll be able to uh, confirm or refute our hypothesis in this model. So the summary of the last part of my talk is that we identified a novel de novo variant in PAM in a program with early onset diabetes. The variant does not affect uh, PAM amidizing activity. I didn't show you this, but we've been able to establish that. It doesn't affect insulin secretion, but our in vitro data to date uh, support uh, effect on ER stress and cell viability. We haven't found any other cases to date. We continue to look, and we're trying to kick this on further using a mouse model. So the take home messages are that I hope through the course of my talk, I've been able to uh, give you an insight into how uh, a genetic diagnosis can alter treatment and prognosis in monogenic diabetes. I hope I've also given you a taste of the challenges that we face when we uh, try and interpret variants, even when they're in genes that we know are causal for monogenic diabetes. And that it really does require main expertise it requires um, integration of multiple types of data and collaboration with a wide variety of centers. I hope also with the last part of this talk that I can give you some uh, insights into how we may be able in the future to use uh, genetics to stratify patients with type 2 diabetes so that we can deploy existing therapies uh, to the patient. So it leaves me to thank the wonderful group of uh, individuals back in Oxford and elsewhere had the pleasure of working with and who are responsible for the data I generated today. I hope I've name checked them all uh, throughout. I'd particularly like to remind you about Shivani's work uh, on the A25T variant, fantastic Sarah, who's been responsible for the MAID and also the novel approach to analyzing functional data. We couldn't do it without Samina and Fernando, who've been uh, phenomenal fans in the lab. This is Team Pam over here, Pam Brothers, we affectionately call them, who are responsible for the Pam work. And my I'd like to thank my team and my funders, and importantly, these are some of the artists who hope to be entertaining you with the pictures of a uh, sign. Thank you very much. Thank you.
So the question is asking about whether or not I deployed in the lab any uh, experimental strategies that might uh, give clues on what uh, the modifying factors are for penetrance in uh, a genetic etiology, in, in this case HNF1-alpha. So if we go back to Shivani's A251T, you're absolutely right. If we look at the clinical characteristics of the carriers in the family I presented, and also in a, a series of other probands that we've identified the variant in through other studies, it's, it does look as if BMI is the modifier. So there's a difference in BMI um, between the mother and the father in that family, uh, which might affect uh, penetrance. The mum, interestingly, was diagnosed with gestational diabetes, um, and then her diabetes uh, uh, stayed on after, after pregnancy. And I sus suspect it was the uh, uh, insulin resistance during pregnancy that were, and the gain in weight that was the modifier there. And certainly we see in some of the other families that the, the BMI is much larger, and um, I think uh, contributes to the penetrance. To answer specifically whether we've done that experimentally, I think those would be uh, great experiments to do, but they would be uh, pretty uh, large experiments to undertake in a way that would be meaningful. Um, perhaps at a time where we can work at scale at a cheaper price, um, those would be things that we should definitely think about doing. Thank you.